This is the second time that the Wallace Collection has worked with the Foundation. And here I'm Xavier Bray, the director of the collection, and I, I'm very keen on these uh, connections to be made between uh, the arts of ballet, of music. Indeed, uh, during the lockdown, we uh, were the temporary home of the uh, Orpheus Symphonia, and then to the English National Ballet School, who came and did their uh, choreography course here uh, in the great courtyard. So it's something we, we very much want to carry on with. Uh, we do have paintings such as Madame de Camargo doing a beautiful point. Viviana Durante got into the position a few months ago of our beautiful Lancre painting upstairs. So the connections are all there uh, to be made and I'm very much looking forward to this evening's lecture. A quick plug for the Wallace Collection to those here and to those online. Uh, we're about to open a major Franz House exhibition next week, Portraits of Men, just men, so don't worry, <laughs> they are very feminine looking men, uh, dressed in a beautiful attire. Um, and it should be a, a great show. It's basically uh, the Laughing Cavalier with his best friends. Um, and it's, it promises to be a very exciting exhibition. For, so for those who have time to come, please return. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Christopher Nurse, who's going to introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the trouble with being the second speaker, of course, is that the first speaker has already said quite a lot of the things that you were planning to say. Um, but I will just repeat, Kelly, how pleased we are to be back here at the Wallace Collection. Uh, the relationship between the Frederick National Foundation and the Wallace Collection is a strong one, and uh, we look forward to many further collaborations. So, ladies and gentlemen, as Executive Director of the Frederick National Foundation, it falls on me to sort of formally introduce the 2021 Frederick Ashton Lecture, which is the second uh, lecture in our series of uh, biannual lectures given in the name of Frederick Ashton, uh, given uh, to both honor the memory of the great choreographer, but also to uh, advance public understanding and debate about the arts. Um, I think this evening is special for, for three reasons. Firstly, it is the opening salvo in the Frederick Ashton Foundation's 10th anniversary season. We have two big events coming up next October. Uh, one is the premiere of a film which has been commissioned by the Ashton Foundation uh, on Frederick Ashton and how you pass on the choreography and the intentions of a choreographer from one generation to another. Uh, that goes on in the middle of October. And then a week later, um, the foundation is in the Lindbury Theatre of the Opera House, where we will be showing some of the uh, extracts from various masterclasses that we've put on over the last 10 years, and, uh, interestingly, uh, reviving a piece which Ashton first created in 1977 on Mario Fontaine and Rudolf Neuer. Hamlet and Ophelia to the music of Liszt. It only received eight or nine performances uh, back then and so uh, 27th of October we'll see the, the premiere of this new production. It's going to be in new designs and we have Francesca Hayward and William Bracewell uh, dancing the two roles. Later in the season we go back to doing our popular Ashton Masterclasses and at the end of uh, our season, uh, the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet have generously programmed uh, an All Ashton program, uh, which will mark the end of our celebratory season. The second reason why I think this evening is important is because it falls within a week, which also marks the 117th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Ashton. Uh, Friday the 17th, this Friday, will be his birthday. Uh, he was born in Guayaquil in Ecuador and of course it was in South America in Peru where he saw uh, Anna Pavlova dancing and um, quoted the words which all of you here will probably have heard before, she uh, injected me with her poison. He knew then that his life was destined to be in dance. But the third and most important special reason for being here this evening is because we are going to be privileged to hear uh, someone speaking who is uh, a distinguished composer, a well-known broadcaster. Indeed, I'm not quite sure why I'm standing here introducing him because he doesn't really need any introduction. All I will say is that, and this may not be known by everybody, is that he was uh, on the board of the Royal Opera House for many years. He was the chairman of the Royal Ballet Governors for many years. And so he does know 
quite a bit about dance. Um, that being said, uh, the lecture is by no means confined to dance issues. Uh, Frederick Ashton himself was a, was a polymath. He was inspired by music, obviously, and most importantly, but by paintings and by design, architecture, literature. Um, and so to reflect his wide interests, uh, the speaker of our lectures um, is able to talk about the arts in their widest sense. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I please ask you to give a very, very warm welcome to Lord Barclay of Knighton, better known to all of us as Michael Barclay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christopher, and good evening. Um, I want to start near to home because as a child, uh, I remember frequent references to Frederick Ashton, a longtime friend of my father, Lennox Barclay. I remember too the occasional visit from the elegant Fred and the naughty Billy Chapel, his partner and often collaborator, both as dancer and designer. Lennox had a still closer friendship with the composer Maurice Ravel, who was indeed his mentor, and he attended the triumphant premiere of Bolero with Ravel in Paris on the 20th of November 1928 with Ida Rubinstein center stage. Outside the opera, Ravel called a cab and took Lennox and his friends to Le Boeuf sur le Toit a couple of minutes away. Now it's often assumed that Mio wrote his surrealist ballet with that name with the cafe in mind, but actually it was the other way around. The cafe took its name from the music, doubtless in the hope that Les Six and Jean Cocteau would patronize it, which they certainly did. Stravinsky, who will loom large in my deliberations, advised that great artists steal lesser ones borrow. So I'm going to follow those strictures and plunder Tony Scotland's brilliant book about my parents, Lennox and Frieda, as I return to 1928. There was probably a backstage gossip that night with Ravel, Lennox, and the two young English dancers. One was Cocteau's ex-lover, Rupert Doon, who was a soloist in the Rubinstein Company but he gave up dancing a couple of years later to found the Group Theatre of London, where he directed various productions involving Auden, Isherwood, and Britain. The other dancer was Frederick Ashton. He had joined Edith Rubinstein at the beginning of August and spent his first few weeks in Paris living in Lennox's flat in Montmartre, while Lennox was in the south of France with his parents. I discovered much about my father that was complete news to me. In Tony's book, I found out that according to Ashton, the reclusive Mademoiselle Rubinstein used to take class separately from the company, but when it was necessary to, as she put it, piece things together, her chauffeur would drive her to the rehearsal hall, then roll out a red carpet so she could walk to the door like a star. For some of the Bolero rehearsals, the dancers were summoned to Rubinstein's elegant house in the Place des Etats Unis and told to put on clean white shirts and white socks. Before entering the Bast designed interiors, each boy was handed a bottle of eau de cologne because Ida Rubinstein could not bear the smell of sweat, problematic if involved in this particular art form. White gloved and richly clad in furs, she walked herself through her part while the mystified dancers simply watched, feeling that they were nothing less than a ballet, as Ashton put it, run by an electress of a palatinate for her own amusement. At the end of the rehearsal, a footman passed round a plate of petit four. Though Rubinstein was remote, enigmatic and dictatorial, Ashton admitted that she had style and dignity and immaculate manners. He was mesmerized by her tall, slim figure, dark russet hair and heavy lidded eyes, even if he didn't have the highest regard for her actual dancing. And in particular, her false teeth, which once dropped out while she was taking an arabesque in Les Sulfides. 
For the rest of, for the rest of, uh, of his life, Fred dined out on his Ida Rubinstein impression, tottering around like a sick ostrich with curiously hunched shoulders and spread bent knees, throwing back his head, fluttering his eyes and making little mues. Billy Chapel and the painter Edward Burrow had travelled up to Paris after a sailor spotting holiday with some lesbian friends on the Mediterranean at Toulon. Well, you get the picture. Um, this was not a picture I had had up until then. In that same year, uh, Lennox, much taken with Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, finished the piano score of his ballet, The Judgment of Paris, a short piece based on the mythological beauty contest that led to the Trojan War. Musically, the score is clearly influenced by the neoclassicism of Stravinsky's Apollon Musagette, which Lennox saw in Paris during its European premiere uh, at the Ballet Russe. Lennox returned to London in February 1938 with Jean Francais, the French composer, and he discovered from Francais uh, that the Vic Wells Company were looking for a new short piece for the current season. In particular, the company needed a filler for a fundraising gala in May, a piece d'occasion, that would serve as a showpiece for Pearl Argyle, one of the celebrated beauties of the age. Fred was now the chief choreographer of the Vic Wells, but Lennox also knew Constant Lambert, the company's music director. So Lennox went up to Sadler's Wells to play his Judgment of Paris to Ashton, Lambert, and of course the director of the Vic Wells, Ninette de Valois. The verdict was very positive and agreement was soon reached on casting. Boozy and Hawks were very taken with the score, as actually was Benjamin Britten, who suggested some improving points of orchestration. Ashton himself was to create the choreography. Robert Helpman was to be Paris and Pearl Argyle Venus, sharing the role in repertory with Margot Fontaine. Argyle had become Ashton's first English muse, following her performance as a more proactive Venus in his interlude, uh, Mars and Venus, in 1929. Land Lambert himself was going to conduct, and Billy Chapel was to create the costumes and the scenery. The premiere was set for the 10th of May, and the Judgment of Paris was to be given another performance on the last night of the season, and another three were also scheduled. Come the big night, Benjamin Britten caught the train up from Suffolk, and Queen Elizabeth motored round from Buckingham Palace with a posse of gentlewomen, women who had kindly consented to sell programmes. The purpose of the gala was to raise £24,000, still needed, for essential additions to Sadler's Wells, in memory of Lillian Bayliss, the theatre's founder. It was an almost entirely English programme put together by Ninette de Valois. In the first part, a revival of Bliss's Checkmate and Lambert's Horoscope. In the second part, Lennox's New Judgment of Paris and the Maya Beer Lambert Les Patineurs. As the only premiere, uh, Paris obviously attracted quite a bit of attention. Argyle, it was reported, looked divinely fair, condescended to do the splits, shed her skirt to reveal a fetching little undergarment, and so upstaged the goddesses Juno and Minerva that Paris had no option but to give the golden apple to her. The willowy chapel, Dancing Mercury, designed for himself a daringly brief tunic of white and gold in which he posed provocatively on a flight of steps beside some classical columns. Ashton intimated that he liked Lennox above all other composers, even Constant, but though he was to be involved in at least five further ballet productions, including two choreographed by Chapel, Lennox never actually worked with Fred Ashton again, though not for want of Ashton's trying. In the early 1980s, Ashton asked him to write a full-length ballet for Covent Garden, but Lennox was struggling with his final and sadly never completed opera, Folden Park. Um, in fact, he was suffering from uh, Alzheimer's as well. 
Um, he was also a bit disconcerted by the fact that Ben Britton uh, said that he'd been exhausted by the effect of composing his three-act ballet, The Prince of the Pagodas. Tony Scotland's latest book, Wolf, which is published by Shelf Lives, is also something of a short eye-opener, de detailing as it does, the life of Britain's young muse, Wolf Schirken. It's a really fascinating read. Another family connection we had with Ashton was the painter John Craxton. Both Lennox and I had received commissions in return for paintings. Uh, John's sister was a very famous oboist called Janet. Um, but it was typical of Ashton's genius earlier that he had winkled Johnny away from Crete to come and design Daphne and Chloe at Covent Garden. There's a wonderful photograph of John and Margot Fontaine on holiday. On the stage, she was partnered by Michael Soames. The opening of Daphnis is, like Britain's first sea interlude in Peter Grimes, one of the great joyous moments of musical praise to the beauty of nature, birds, and dawning light. For all the bohemian trappings of his early life at Oxford, Paris, Suffolk, and in London, Lennox was, as I've suggested to our eyes as young children, quiet, introverted, and totally wrapped up in his music. So this early life, which in Paris embraced friendship with the Stravinsky family, was to us three boys utterly revelatory. Given the connections with French music, it was perhaps natural, though, that Lennox should be asked to help with a foray score for André Howard, a dancer with the Ballet Russe and a choreographer, and he made an early version of Fête étranger for two pianos, uh, and later for orchestra, last seen and heard when the Royal Ballet danced it in 2005 with Darcy Bustle and Ricardo Severus in the lead roles. It was, in fact, Ravel who suggested Lennox study with Nadia Boulanger in Paris, and as a result, he met Sublima Stravinsky, the composer's son. He was in the same class. At the Stravinsky household, Lennox got to know uh, the maestro, who was composing, he told me, using an upright piano with a blanket stuffed in it to muffle the sound. He didn't want an instrumental sound to come back at him, but he did need to check the notes. And so he just wanted some kind of feedback, something that would give him the ability to be sure that he was hearing what he was writing correctly. Now here in the Wallace collection, we've been hearing about Howells and of course Rubens, uh, but we have the greatest visual testaments to the emotion of joy and awe, because in the work of, well, Rembrandt, that touching and tactile portrait of his son Titus, Murillo, Canaletto's delights in the joyous sparkling canals of Venice, and of course, the penetrating gaze of Velasquez, we find not only innovation, but perhaps more importantly, the ability to sculpt and develop tradition with personal vision. Nothing in art can ever be totally new. Everything is a synthesis of past experience. But when formed, but when informed with an original voice, it becomes new, as we have seen in so many great choreographers. In fact, I've called this talk Shock, Joy and All because there are emotions I've relished um, when encountering those artists and present ones, whether it be Harrison Burtwistle, Akram Khan, Wayne McGregor, Sean Scully, George Benjamin, Pina Bausch, or my predecessor at this lectern, Nicholas Heitner. And there are two, the old works that seem ever new, Jackson Pollock's Use of Chance, Mark Rothko's Spatial Experiments with Color, Mark Morris's joyous reworking of Handel in L'Allegro. Those special experiences that are etched into our memories. Now, the Rite of Spring was just that for so many of us. I was still very young when Lennox took me to hear uh, Stravinsky conduct Le Sacre and to meet the composer. Combined with my own growing awareness through improvisation, it was, as Graham Greene so tellingly put it, that one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. Are we giving children today the opportunity to experience the movement of that door? 
I think, sadly, not as much as we should be. Being a chorister at Westminster Cathedral, I was used to singing Gregorian chant and polyphonic masterpieces by Victoria, Palestrina, Talis, Bird, and even the first performance of the Britain Miss Bravis. But the sheer visceral, sexual, and even cruel rhythms of Lesac were exhilarating in their ability to shock. They seemed to realize the ideas swimming around in my head and in my, improvisation, in my improvisations when I would sing myself to sleep. There is joy, of course, too, in the use of Russian folk song, right from the opening phrase, high on a bassoon. Uh, there a territory up there on a bassoon that must have been terrifying for the first player when he encountered it. Start solo on a high C, is the composer nuts? Joy and certainly awe at the sheer newness of this language, of Stravinsky aping the sound of the ice cracking and breaking apart in the Russian spring. I've had the great pleasure of working with Deborah Bull, not just in the Lords, where we often join forces on behalf of the arts and arts education, but also co-presenting a Royal Ballet production of The Right of Spring for BBC TV with Richard Alston, thus bringing together aspects of the music and dance. People able to teach me about the technical difficulties of mounting Le Sac while I talked about the music. Now, if the music were not so original, so individual, the score might seem episodic rather than organic. There is in the writing the thumbprint of a composer working with a keyboard. Those repeated chords on the eight horns with their offbeat accents are, in fact, simply but wonderfully two triads, E flat major in one hand and an octave apart, E minor in the other. Clearly an idea heard at the piano, where they fit the hands like velvet but ruthless gloves. Lennox actually was probably still keener on the neoclassical works like Apollon Mazaget and the neoclassical music so wonderfully choreographed by Balanchine the oral equivalence, if you like, of Picasso's blue period, where the pure strength of voice means that new work is created out of old, but with total freshness. I remember, as an overawed child, saying tentatively to Stravinsky, he was quite a formidable presence, how I loved the use of the four pianos in Les Nos, and how excited I was by the use of two flutes in thirds, in the cadence to Symphony of Psalms, scored as a high major third in a way that broke all the existing rules of orchestration at the time, and even when I was later a composition student at the Royal Academy of Music. But in this instance, in the Symphony of Psalms, they act as the most perfect and fulfilling, if protracted, full stop. Stravinsky smiled benevolently. Not unpleased, I think, that the high thirds in the flutes had registered with a young composer. Other composer friends of Lennox and Frieda would come to supper when I was a child, and indeed, Britain was my godfather. Two who had a particularly mischievous glint in the eye were Francis Poulenc, a benevolent sparkle, I would say, and William Walton, a rather more caustic glimmer. Poulenc and Lennox took a delight in the naughty, as Lennox put it, but succulent harmony francaise that makes so many Poulenc pieces idiosyncratic and irresistible, like the Gloria, which Kenneth Macmillan made into such a wonderfully effective piece of dance for the Royal Ballet, and which Darcy Bustle chose for the Radio 3 programme I've presented since 1995, Private Passions. She chose the Laudamus Te, a, a, a bit that always makes me smile. I want to concentrate on the importance of new work because we, I think, are at a dangerous crossroads in the arts, and new work is all too often the first victim of cuts. Many dancers and musicians are freelance, and many fell through the support network that was supposed to help them over the last year when all work had to stop because of COVID. Now, of course, the Chancellor's Fund for the Arts was very important. It would be churlish not to welcome it but it did tend to be institution-based. 
using existing Arts Council clients. So it didn't actually get to individuals or small companies specialising in new work. Many of these same people are going to suffer a double whammy because the Brexit negotiations, utterly, I think, disastrous for the arts, despite Boris Johnson's promises, have pulled the rug from under our ability to tour and to export our work. This despite the government's consistent, consistently saying how much it appreciates and values the work of the creative industries, which of course bring in billions to the exchequer, and in fact dwarf that brought to our shores by the fishing industry, much though I am a fisherman. I've yet to hear the Lords a single non-ministerial supporter of Brexit, and there are several whose intellect I admire, speak up about the disastrous negotiations that led to us shamefully rejecting reciprocal offer from the EU for touring because the Home Office did not want to appear to be undermining even remotely its red lines on migration. Culture is all about curiosity and the exchange of ideas. So it's not just what we can no longer export to Europe, but the European work that we're not experiencing here that is at stake. If you're trying to put together a viable economic tour, then you need constancy in regulations, visas and work permits. I know several musicians for whom the cost of setting up and paying for this has virtually eliminated their entire fee. The, DCM is, um, the DCMS is trying to find a bilateral way through, and if they can successfully negotiate with Spain, that will at least be a huge step forward. But we are, in fact, closing the stable door after the horse has bolted, and the EU will be for imposing further red tape next year with its ETIAS regulations. I tried to stand in a fairly neutral position as a crossbencher in the Lords, and when and if I see sense coming from the government, I support them. But I have to say that in terms of the arts, if COVID and the Brexit touring debacle were not terrible cards enough to be dealt, there's a further, even more fundamental, indeed, I think, shocking challenge to the creativity, creativity of our nation, which I've just touched on. The removal of arts and music from the regular curriculum and the cessation of peripatetic teaching, which means that learning an instrument or taking class in dance has become too much the preserve of the rich and privileged. Many contributors to private passions, like Tom Courtney and Alan Plater, have said how much they owe to the arts at school and one passionate teacher when they were members of fairly impoverished families. Caddy Carnu Mason, the mother of the remarkable Carnu Mason family, recently told us that had it not been for the free music lessons then available in state schools and now absent, we would not have the likes of Sheku and his sisters to brighten our lives with their inspired music making. She wondered what was happening to gifted children from non-privileged families like her own, not to mention the effects on exposure to the arts on all children, gifted or not. In fact, how can you possibly know at that age? It slightly sickens me to see these gifted artists like Shaku, and they're very aware of this, being lauded and held aloft by our system, while simult simultaneously it's refusing similar access to tuition to their successors. If we are seriously in debt to our cultural sector, why are we not investing in the next generation to continue the work? Let's increase the music of every sort that children sing and hear at assembly, for example, as part of their natural day. Then there is the social dividend of giving young people a creative means to self-expression. I believe that if teenagers can make music, drama and dance as an outlet for those turbulent years, then they're just that much less likely to turn to drugs and granny bashing. I've seen the effects and they were memorably brought home to me when working with the Kersler Trust to put more art in prisons. I had a letter from a man from whom we had been able to procure a guitar. He wrote to me, and I quote, playing this instrument has transformed my life and I cannot help thinking that if I'd had this ability 
to make music when I was younger and as an outlet for my anger, I would not now be serving life for murder. A sobering and telling thought. And at lunchtime today, uh, I heard a 12-year-old saying how music calmed her, how it was an outlet for all the, what she was thinking and how much she loved being able to play her violin, which she'd originally chosen simply because it was the prettiest instrument on offer. I've had the privilege of working with many choreographers and dancers, and my admiration for the sheer dedication and physical hard work that they undertake knows no bounds. I also simply like them very much. Um, my first collaboration was with Michael Pink and a piece called Attractions, created for Northern Ballet in 1982. Two years later, I teamed up with Lynn Seymour for two very, very different pieces. The Mayfly in 1984, starring Wayne's Sleep and a troupe of brownies, <laughs> um, created uh, in the most bizarre circumstances. Stephen Pyle, author of the Book of Heroic Failures, wrote a piece in the Sunday Times about the Edinburgh Festival and rhetorically asked, why Edinburgh? Why not Netherwallop? Well, of course, he was then challenged to do just that. Create an international festival, the first, and as it turned out, the last, Netherwallop International Festival. Stephen decided on a philosophy of in for a penny, in for a pound, and invited an amazing roster of artists. Since the whole thing was done for charity, once a couple of big names fell into place, initially Paul McCartney, Others came falling like a deck of cards. This was the genesis, actually, of comic relief, because charity projects, which op organized the whole affair and sold the television rights to London Weekend, subsequently morphed into comic relief. Stephen took his zany, plant, uh, zany slant to wonderfully ludicrous extremes, the idea being that artists should realize uh, unfulfilled fantasies. Thus, Jenny Agatha, bedecked in a saucy outfit, became the vicar stroke conjurer's assistant. Jesse Norman turned the pages for the choir mistress, but when it was suggested she might sing, she replied, perhaps having now heard the pianistic talents on hand, that yes, she might just manage an unaccompanied spiritual. But before she could utter a, a single note, she was bustled off the stage so that we would not be late for Colonel Mew's organ recital. Thus, the greatest soprano in the world never got to open her mouth in combat. Was there really a Colonel Mew, or was this just another invention of Stephen's fertile mind? Rick Mayle came onto the stage and told the audience that it was great to be in the nether regions. He sang a hilarious song with Jules Holland at the piano and Bill Wyman on the bass. Trevor Nunn directed the pageant, and in University Challenge, Bamber Gascoigne introduced great philosophers of the world, Professor A.J. Eyre, Arnold Zuboff, and Jerry Cohen, versus Nether Wallop Farmers. The philosophers were asked questions about the gestation period of a cow, while Bamber quizzed the farmers on Wittgenstein and Nietzsche. Real Madrid were booked to play Nether Wallop FC. Lynn Seymour and I were asked to put together a ballet, and it was the Mayfly for the local Brownie troupe with Wayne Sleep. Now, rehearsals got very delayed, where well, we had to send out a search party for him, and he was finally extricated from the local barracks, where he had doubtless been entertaining the troops. Nevertheless, it was a, a serious and charming little piece about the life of the Mayfly, and the Brownies lapped it up. Wayne, of course, is always great fun to work with. I think the moral of this narrow wallop story is that almost anything is possible if the context is right and a couple of big hitters sign up to kick the whole thing into being. But I also believe, having run and partially run three festivals, that you have to start any creative project with an unshakable determination that it is going to happen and it's going to happen your way. When I began my tenure artistic directorship of the Cheltenham Festival, I was intent on making it a fulcrum for new work, requiring every musician to include a contemporary composer in their programme. 
in collaboration with Jonathan Rieke at the Almeida, I managed to secure the first performance of Tom Addis's first opera, Powder Her Face. This and Tom's residency really put us on the map, as well as, well as giving the stunned burghers of this Regency spa town their first stage reenactment of uh, Fellatio. In that lovely Frank Matcham theatre, I also brought in dance from Shobna Jair Singh, the Ballet Boys, and Sue Davis. What has happened in the arts world would make these kind of initiatives almost impossible now, unless it was in London or one of the major large cities. Bastet was commissioned from Lynn and me by the legendary Peter Wright in 1988 for Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet. And I well remember his kindly but slightly resigned expression while watching our rehearsals. Lynn, after all, was one of the most sensuous and expressive dancers of her generation, for whom Kenneth Macmillan created those tempestuous roles. And perhaps it's just asking too much to expect a dancer to be able to translate her sublime gifts for lyrical sensuality and sexuality into choreography. I concocted to her scenario a score full of rhythmic action I think it's the polite way of putting it. Perhaps the best part of the show was Andrew Logan's designs for this imaginative tale of the Egyptian athletic cat goddess. Stravinsky, Prokofiev, and Shostakovich crop up on private passions with the same regularity that they appear on the stage. What is it about these Russian scores, I often wonder, that make them so eminently danceable and the music more memorable than many other famous ballets. I got to live with and study Prokofiev's compositional technique when the choreographer Kim Branstrup asked me to complete a score that Prokofiev had started for a projected film of the Ace of Spades until Stalin closed down the Russian film industry. Composed at the same time, as the iconic Romeo and Juliet, 1936. It has passages of the same brilliance, the same beauty, equal brilliance, a ball scene, for instance. So I was delighted that Naima Yevi recorded it with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra for Chandos. Kim created an original scenario but I can also imagine the suite being married and choreographed to the Ace of Spades story for which it was intended, and including that terrific ball scene, which was superfluous to Kim's scenario. Varied repetition and phrasing, by which I really mean, I suppose, breathing, and the ability to give a character musical personality, plus that natural sense of dramatic timing, are what I learnt from Prokofiev's score. What must he have thought when Stalin's dictum simply meant that his wonderful ideas had to be buried deep in a bottom drawer? Little wonder that the passages of turbulence speak so loudly. This was an extremely happy collaboration, as Kim is intensely musical. Rush's Fragments of a Lost Story featured some of the Royal Ballet's most gifted dancers. Who would not be thrilled to be arranging and elaborating Prokofiev for Alina Kojikaru, Tamara Rohu, Carlos Acosta, Leanne Benjamin, Laura Moreno, and Thomas Whitehead, to name just a few. To see the nuances and inflections which I had put into the music and which Prokofiev had put there, put to dance by artists of this stature, is a privilege indeed. In fact, Alina so liked the final final pas de deux that she asked me if she could extract and dance it in a special program in Moscow. At Covent Garden, Rush's, I thought, looked silky in John Kalman's lighting, almost a natural extension of Richard Hudson's design and Kim's subtle choreography, which, as Jenny Gilbert noted, does not shout at you but creeps up on you like a shadow on a wall. Subtlety is key. As director of the Royal Ballet, Monica Mason was always enormously supportive of her artists on and off the stage. So much so that when I was chairman of the governors, as Christopher mentioned, I thought not twice, but four times before offering, before offering any sense of criticism, but there was hardly ever any uh, moment when it was necessary. I remember when I was on the Royal Opera House board, feeling that my primary duty 
was to the art forms and the artists. So when it was seriously suggested that during the closure period of the house that the Royal Ballet simply be shut down for two years, I was appalled. The import of this idea will not be lost on anyone in this room and probably nobody else watching either. Covid has given us a taste of what this can mean. I immediately got on to Vivian Duffield and John Sainsbury, who doubtless enlisted Geoffrey Sterling. Guess what? After a few phone calls and the suggestion that certain funding was about to be withdrawn, this crazy idea was quickly buried. Those generous donors, like the Robertstons and the Robies, must never be taken for granted, especially by governments, simply because they're there to help us. They must not be used as an excuse not to pay what we should, as a society, be paying for art at this level. As you will have realised, I'm excited by a creativity that makes us look at our world afresh, or re-examines the past from a new angle, as did both Balanchine and Ashton in their own way. It is this fresh look at what we can do with the human body, which I've seen at uh, Birmingham Royal Ballet and at Royal Ballet School and, of course, on the stage at Royal Ballet. It is this look uh, that made me particularly excited to be asked to work with Wayne McGregor on his realisation of Bach's The Art of Fugue to practice. Basically, my task was to help choose the movements and acoustically amplify the original keyboard score, for which I used a Mozart-sized band uh, though it could also work with single strings or even early instruments. Several dancers I'd already got to know and love, like Sarah Lamb, Stephen McRae, Frederico Bonelli and Edward Watson, took part, and there was the very considerable addition of Natalia Osipova. It seems that our great national institutions, like the Royal Ballet, Royal Opera, and orchestras like the LSO will be ring-fenced by the DCMS. But the problem is that it's often the small companies that are the engine room for a new talent and the experimental that those larger companies can't always afford to embrace. So a bedrock of work is being threatened from under the feet of all our creative industries. Furthermore, those small-scale companies feed into the majors. Music has an extraordinary ability to speak to babies, to the brain impaired, and I've often thought of dance as the personification of music in movement. The expression of rhythm with sticks and stones, with foot stamping, was the earliest means of communicating joy and aggression, while rhythm itself preceded even that. A huge amount of music, especially popular music, is based on the human heartbeat and its subdivisions. In other words, 60 becomes 120 in most rock music. Those 60 seconds in a minute cannot wait for any man, since they take their cue from the moon and from the regularity of tidal movement. As a child in Norfolk, I was always amazed that the local boatmen and fishermen knew exactly when a high, high and low tide would be without consulting scientific paperwork. So we are inextricably tied to nature's rhythms. We cannot, though we might like to, change our darkening evenings. How we process rhythm, and indeed music itself, is one of my favourite topics on private passions when I have a neuroscientist in my grasp. My first wife, Deborah Rogers, who sadly died suddenly seven years ago, was an eminent, eminent literary agent. And through her and private passions, I got to know Oliver Sacks, who said that he found music to be invaluable in forming a bridge to sufferers of neurological malfunction or damage. He recalled one patient who, because we process music on a different side of the brain from speech, would look completely clueless when told, do up your shoes. But when Oliver sang, do up your shoes, the patient bent down and tied up his laces. Oliver was himself pretty crazy by any standards. On being given tea before recording Private Passions at our house in Notting Hill, he went round the kitchen obsessively nibbling and tasting everything, including the cat food. One of his choices for Private Passions, by the way, was the Infernal Dance from Stravinsky's Farbird. 
The infernal idea continued with the final scene from Don Giovanni, where Mozart stretches his harmonic and dramatic muscles to send the Don down to hell in a terrifying sequence of vengeful justice. Music that exhilaratingly looks over the brim of the 18th century and classicism and into the romantic maelstrom of the 19th. The, two, the choice of two pieces to do with Farr was perhaps not entirely musical. Not only did Oliver have an obsessive need to touch and taste everything in sight, but Deborah told me that he had a very real fear that he might internally combust. She had to book him into hotels that had not only a swimming pool, but one that would allow the use of his flippers. My librettist collaborator, a wonderful Australian writer and poet, David Malouf, reported that on a book tour in Australia, Oliver and he were side by side on a coach on their way to an event that took them through the bush. As the driver excitedly told his passengers how the extreme heat had recently led to several devastating fires near the road, Oliver became increasingly agitated, demanding to know hopelessly where the nearest water was. David was mystified as the distinguished psychoanalysist began to shift ever more violently in his seat, wretched and increasingly fidgeting. On reaching the venue for the literary event, Oliver rushed from the coach and locked himself in a green room, refusing to come out for several hours, despite a large, non-plussed audience, now also becoming rather restless in their seats. Another close friend was Bruce Chatwin, and he and I would talk endlessly about Australia and the ancient song lines. The composer Kevin Volans worked with Bruce and he said that the work of Philip Guston, the painter, and the chance in creativity, the synthesis that we see in the studio when people are sparking off each other, is a fantastically important part of their work. I explored the history of the song lines while walking with a guide, a native of the King's Canyon area near Ayers Rock. He also taught me the secret of walking for miles in high temperatures, and his advice echoed the disciplines of both dance and the farming that I've been part of in uh, the Welsh marches on Offa's Dyke. It's all to do with natural rhythms again. This is a land in Wales uh, of shale, but in the wonderful red earth of Australia, there needed to be, in addition to the correct clothing, hats and boots, hydration. Every 15 minutes, my guide would insist that we stop and sip water. And in fact, we weren't allowed to begin unless we were carrying at least two litres. On the farm, I noticed how the local boys would stagger bale stacking, not crush at it, but find a tempo with pauses for water and gossip. They achieved far more at a measured pace than some guests who, willing to help out and keen to show their mettle, were soon exhausted by their racing to the task. When I talk about natural rhythms, I think I'm also embracing the nature of relaxation. Whether you're a dancer, a tennis player, or a violinist, if you are tensed up and anxious, movement does not flow naturally. When you are relaxed, that technique begins to appear effortless. In fact, technique allows relaxation. Strangely, I've observed not only humans being calmed by music, but also animals. They become transfixed. Many farmers leave a radio on in their cow sheds. We have two red bulls, James and Jaffa. James is placid, Jaffa more temperamental, and especially after he had to have a throat treated, which required him to be lifted in a special machine onto his side. Then he had the foot cleansed and what looked like the sole of a shoe glued to his hoof. Following this undignified performance, none of the boys could get anywhere near Jaffa. Then one day, I was in the barn alone with him. I leant over the rails and sang to him a slow chant-like refrain. He pricked up his ears and then lumbered over to me nuzzling 
I stroked him and continued to sing, and he clearly appreciated the music. Of course, even a nozzle from a bull weighing a ton can be dangerous. Uh, they don't know their strength. But I have a, an enchanting video of this exchange for anybody who doubts my word and my tousling his curly head. I've repeated this exercise with the same results, but I have to be careful because if when he's out in the fields, he comes over to me for an embrace, I would not have those metal rails to protect me from a sudden throw of his enormous neck. I was very touched by this experience, which once again demonstrated the ability of music to communicate across barriers. Dance and music, and music as expressed by the movement of the human body, offer us a catharsis into which we can all enter. The body becomes a musical instrument, inflecting musical lines as a great cellist might. As an audience, we bring our own emotions to that experience and take from it a greater understanding of our own lives, the beauty that we all aspire to, a disturbance we crave, and a symmetry that we envy. We continue the synthesis of ancient tribal life with essentially the same means. I was privileged to be given this opportunity as a child, the opportunity, opportunity that has made Sheku the cellist he is. I want to see every child given the wonderful chance to explore creativity, the ability to express themselves, regardless of circumstance, rich or poor. <laughs>